Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. I hope that you're all doing well and I hope that you're all safe. I think we've come to a point now in the pandemic where it's appropriate just to pause and reflect on what we've been taught so far, the lessons that COVID-19 has shown us, and as a consequence, the actions, those tangible actions that we've taken as a result. Obviously, in many countries around the world right now, we are easing lockdown restrictions or kind of reintegrating back into somewhat of a normal society. And so I want to talk about some of the failings of our agricultural system. And I want to pose the question, is this the beginning of the end for animal agriculture. So I think firstly, let's start off a little bit more broad than that, because I think generally speaking, one of the biggest lessons that we've been taught by this pandemic so far, is just how interconnected we all are as a species, how the actions of someone on the other side of the world can have far reaching consequences that in turn affects us as well, and vice versa, of course, the actions that we partake in can affect others. We're in this situation now because of the actions of people who live in Wuhan. That's not to blame people who live in Wuhan, because actually it's a collective responsibility, because it's not just about the consumption of animals from wet markets in Asia. It's about animal farming in general that greatly exacerbates the risk of infectious zoonotic disease. Another thing we've been taught is how, from an environmental perspective, if we give this world space to breathe and to try and regenerate and heal itself, it will do just that. And in a very short space of time, we started to see significant differences, whether that be of wild animals or general pollution levels. When we reduced some of the harm that we're doing to our environment, we saw the benefits of that almost immediately. To me, I think that's a really optimistic thing because it shows moving forward how changes within the way that we live as a species can have really profound and beneficial consequences. I think it's important to note now that nothing that has happened has come as a surprise to infectious disease experts. Governments and experts have known for a long time that we are really at the mercy of a novel infectious disease with a pandemic potential. And we've known that such a disease could cause billions of people to be placed in quarantine, cost the global economy trillions, and in turn kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. But even though our governments have known about this, well, what have they done? This isn't new information. In fact, Dr. Greger was speaking about it over a decade ago, and yet nothing has changed. In fact, we've exacerbated the problems because we're still destroying the natural world, decimating huge areas of rainforest or of natural ecosystems. And importantly, we've also still ramped up the industrialization of animal farming. We're rearing more animals globally than we ever have, even though rearing animals for food in these intense confined conditions is one of the biggest risk factors, if not the biggest risk factor, when it comes to the creation of infectious zoonotic disease. Now, COVID-19 may be strongly thought to have started from a wet market in Asia. But the problem isn't wet markets in Asia, it's animal farming all around the world, which is why the 2009 swine flu pandemic started in Mexico, but the genetic lineage of the virus was traced back to a North Carolina pig farm. It's why the 1918 influenza pandemic, which killed up to 50 million people, started in a Kansas chicken farm. And it's why since the 1970s, we've seen a significant increase in the development of novel infectious diseases such as BSE, and of course, highly dangerous strains of avian influenza like H5N1. In fact, in the 1970s, we entered into something called the third epidemiological transition, which is characterized as being notable due to an explosion in novel infectious disease. Now, it's no coincidence that we entered into the third epidemiological transition around the same time that we ramped up the industrialization of animal farming and began consuming even more meat, dairy, and eggs. Ultimately, from an agricultural perspective, COVID-19 has shown how when we exploit animals, that in turn comes back to us and causes us suffering as well as a species. That's a really important thing to recognize because like I said earlier, we've been shown how we're all interconnected, but that's just not interconnectedness between humans, that's interconnectedness between all life. It's exposed again the facade that farmers love their animals. I mean, right around the world, currently, tens of millions of animals have been killed in farms in truly horrendous ways. In fact, it's just been exposed in the US that on a pig farm, these farmers were keeping the pigs inside the barns, turning off the ventilation, and pumping the barns full of hot steam and steaming these animals to death. When I was reading that, what disturbed me wasn't just what was happening. It was the idea that it doesn't matter how much we learn about what we do to animals, there is always something that we don't know. Some other brutal and horrible and violent thing that we do to animals. It doesn't matter how much I educate myself, I always find myself becoming so shocked and disappointed by the number of ways in which we violently persecute and kill these animals. We do so many horrible things to them and yet there's always something that we do to them that we've not learned about yet. It's just... It's really disappointing, and I think that's something that's actually been shown to so many people now. As vegans, we were aware of it before, the culling of animals, the complete disregard for their life, but now I think the wider population has been shown the true horrors 
of animal farming and the complete disregard that we have for non-human animal life. We've also been shown throughout the pandemic what little regard the industry has for human life as well, how slaughterhouse workers don't just only have exceptionally high rates of mental health problems, but are also in times like this forced to work in these environments even though doing so comes at a great risk to their life. It's also shown to us just how irresponsibly we spend money on these industries. I mean, around the world we spend hundreds of billions subsidizing and giving bailouts to an industry that simply wouldn't survive in the free market which just further illustrates how absurd this situation is because in the US, Trump has just signed a $19 billion bailout to the industry. But bailouts and subsidies are socialist fiscal measures. And so we have a far right Republican and conservative when it comes to fiscal policy, adopting socialist measures to bail out this industry because it simply won't survive in the free market. To further put this into perspective, let's say that coronaviruses and influenzas were caused by chickpeas. So the current pandemic has now been caused by a chick chickpea farmer. How would we then feel if the government signed in a $19 billion bailout to allow chickpea farmers to farm more chickpeas? Now to add further insult to injury, throughout the pandemic the animal agriculture industry has been campaigning to get people to consume more animal products, all whilst those most at risk of dying from COVID-19, except the elderly of course, are those of underlying health conditions such as heart disease, which is caused by our consumption of animal products and can be reversed through a whole foods plant-based diet. Now all of these issues are actually having a huge knock-on effect and people learning about these different systems and situations is causing people to think differently and consequently change how they consume and change how they live. So for example in the UK a survey was done which showed that 20% of Britons are reducing their meat consumption during the pandemic and 15% of Britons are reducing their dairy and or egg consumption during the pandemic. Not only that but there's been record numbers of sign-ups for Meat Free May. Now in the US since the pandemic started, there's been an increase of 264% in the sales of plant-based meat alternatives. And also in the US, there's been a piece of legislation tabled called the Farm System Reform Act, which is seeking to phase out factory farming by the year 2040. It has been championed by representatives and senators, including Elizabeth Warren. Perhaps even more concerning for members of this industry is the fact that investors have been turning their attention away from animal-based foods and turning to plant-based foods instead. In fact, over the years, recent years, we've seen huge yearly growth in the amount of investment into plant-based foods. And during the pandemic, the head of commodities research at Goldman Sachs, which is of course one of the biggest investment banks in the world, had this to say. We had a problem with livestock going into this, we now have a very serious problem. Now a good example of the shifting consumer trends here in the UK can be seen through Wicked Healthy, who have the Wicked Kitchen range in Tesco. Now Tesco is the biggest supermarket chain in the UK. In their first 20 months of trading, they sold 10 million units, which makes it the biggest launch in Tesco history. Now the success of the launch also caused other leading supermarkets to release their own plant-based ranges as well, further amplifying the success of the Wicked Kitchen launch. Now within their range they have a variety of products from sandwiches and wraps to pizzas and ready meals and they're also just about to launch something called Wicked Meaty which is where they're taking plant-based ingredients like mushrooms for example and they're creating like-for-like -like replacements to the products you would normally see down the meat aisle in the supermarket. Now this to me is an absolute game changer because if you're a consumer walking down the meat aisle and you see a product that looks delicious but is also healthier than the meat, is more sustainable than the meat, and also now let's also remember that people are going to be thinking to themselves, you can't produce coronaviruses and influenzas in mushroom farms. When you couple all that together, it creates a very persuasive argument for consumers who are increasingly likely to support those plant-based options instead. Now from a personal perspective, I didn't just want to highlight Wicked Healthy because of their incredibly successful Wicked Kitchen launch but also because it's run by a couple of really good people, Derek and Chad, who I know personally, are really good guys, and importantly, they're staunchly ethical vegan. And it's wonderful now that we live in a society where we can support brands and companies that are not only producing delicious food, but are also doing so to end animal exploitation and to make the world a better place for everyone who lives here. Now that to me is a really important thing. Not only that, but they also have a YouTube channel, which I'll link in one of these top corners now. And on the YouTube channel, they've got some delicious recipes which you can make at home. And they also have this new really cute selection of videos, which is plant-based cooking with children, which is encouraging families to make plant-based food together. So let's pose that question that I mentioned right at the beginning of the video. Is this the beginning of the end for animal agriculture? 
Now, I think we can take everything out of the equation that we just talked about. Let's take everything we just said about investments, about the political spectrum, about the consumer trends, just remove all of that. And let's simplify the situation down. And I just wanna ask you a series of questions and just think to yourself what your answer to these questions would be. Does the taste of the wild animals slaughtered in Wuhan make what is happening right now acceptable or justifiable? Does the economic impact of wild animal farming and the fact that it provides jobs or wet markets provides jobs in Asia, does that make what's happening right now justifiable? And does the fact that it's cultural and traditional for these animals to be raised, farmed and killed in Asia make what's happening now acceptable? Now, I think most of us, if not all of us, have of course answered no to those series of questions. But if we answered no to those series of questions, we must also by default answer no when those questions are changed to reflect animal farming in the places where we live. And so we would say that chicken farming and the taste of chicken does not make avian influenza acceptable. The taste of bacon does not make swine flu acceptable. We say that the economics of animal farming and because animal farming provides jobs doesn't make the future risk of influenza and coronavirus pandemics acceptable. And we say it doesn't matter if it's cultural and traditional that we eat chickens and cows and pigs and ducks, that's irrelevant. Because the fact that it's cultural and traditional does not make the looming impact of antibiotic resistance justifiable and acceptable either. And now antibiotic resistance by the year 2050 will be killing more people than cancer every single year, 10 million lives a year. Not only that, but it'll cost the global economy $100 trillion. We don't think that that's acceptable. And if it's not acceptable, then that means that we need to make changes. Fundamentally, we need to disrupt, change, and dismantle animal agriculture. Ultimately, when we boil it down, animal farming is responsible for causing hundreds of billions of sentient beings intense pain, suffering, and ultimately death. It is also one of the leading industries in many forms of environmental degradation, and often the leading industry in those forms of environmental degradation. The consumption of animal products greatly increases our risk of things like heart disease, certain forms of cancer, stroke, type two diabetes, our leading diseases and illnesses. Illnesses that kill tens of millions of people every single year. Fundamentally, animal agriculture is an industry that has no place in our future. And there are so many things that we can do differently, especially with the subsidies that we continue to give to animal farmers. One of the first things that we can do is give those subsidies to animal farmers, but give them to animal farmers to help them transition to plant-based agriculture. That's one of the most important things that we can do. From an environmental perspective, we can give those subsidies to farmers, but to ensure that they rewild and reforest their lands, better for the environment, better for the animals, better for us. We can also use subsidies to champion technological advancements such as vertical farming and hydroponic systems of agriculture. There are a multitude of solutions that we have at our disposal to make this world a safer place, a more harmonious place, a more ethical place, a healthier place, a more sustainable place both economically as well as environmentally. But importantly, none of those solutions involve the continuation of animal farming. It doesn't matter if you come from the political world, the consumer world, the academic world, or the investment world. That is a realization that more and more people are starting to realize. And the change is inevitable. And so just before the video ends, I want to draw your attention to this, which is a white paper. It's the first white paper that we've ever published at Surge. We got Dr. Michael Greger to go through with his expert opinion because it's a white paper all about how nearly every single major infectious zoonotic disease outbreak in the past 120 years is inextricably linked to our exploitation of animals. Now it's completely free to download on our website, which is www.surgeactivism.org. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, give it a download, read it, and let me know what you think as well. And we really hope that it's a beneficial resource for you guys. So. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I would also like just to draw your attention to my podcast, which is called The Disclosure Podcast. And in recent episodes, I've been talking extensively about the current pandemic. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more or learn a little bit more about my thoughts about certain aspects of it, then check that out, The Disclosure Podcast on Spotify and on iTunes. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please do continue to stay safe, look after yourselves and your loved ones. And I look forward to speaking to you all in the next video.